Next, I would like to introduce um, Haukur Oskarsson. And I think he has a bright future because he's, um, he's a mechanical and uh, uh, he's a mechanic and uh, he's uh, in engineering and he has some business experience. It's not that I'm advertising his CV, but uh, he's working for, for, for Manvit. Uh, he's part of the 400 employees uh, group of uh, dedicated and experienced engineers and technicians uh, who have uh, successfully completed projects on uh, <coughs> almost every, every continent. And uh, in Greenland, the Manvit has been involved in setting up a hydropower plant uh, as well as fuel system upgrades for the military. In particular, Höykur has uh, analyzed uh, opportunities in mining and oil, uh, in, the, in mining and the oil industry, and I know that he's keen on creating a win-win situation and investment cooperation for Iceland and Greenland jointly. So the floor is yours, Höykur, please. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will. Uh, I call the uh, call it Iceland, uh, Greenland, Iceland investment and cooperation opportunities, and that is the uh, part I want to emphasize on. Uh, I will take a look at the cooperation up till now on construction. I will not uh, take a look at uh, all the social and healthcare and that. The, those aspects that has been going on for many years. I will take a brief look at the minerals, oil and gas, processed samples, and then I will come yeah, with a processed sample where we can col collaborate on. Uh, through the years, uh, Icelandic, for example, engineering companies uh, ha has been working with contractors in hydroelectric power plants, on civil works, power lines, and, uh, and fish processing plants. Some of you not, don't remember that, but there was uh, Icelandic companies built six fish processing plants in the 80s, and I think they have been successful also. And for example, my company, the newest, uh, newest uh, project is a fuel upgrade for the military with a Danish contractor. We are Icelanders, we are, we are used to harsh conditions. This is not somewhere up in the Arctic. This is 30 minutes from Reykjavik. So we are used to it. This is at the Hedley City power plant. We have also learned from the Greenlanders. We have learned that an igloo is the best housing in harsh conditions. As you see on the pictures, both the summer pictures and winter pictures, this is what we are using here in Iceland. It's extremely good. And minerals, what is it about? It's about iron ore, it's even about coal, but it's also about the rare earth elements. And what are the rare earth elements? Yes, it is something that we use. We cannot have cell phones or anything else without them. So. Uh, they are, they have been, uh, the Chinese have been sitting on it, it's in Africa, South Africa, and in uh, bundles in Greenland. So that's why the race is on. Uh, that is how it looks like after it has been processed for, from the ore. Uh, in Greenland we have, th there is a three stages in the licenses for minerals. We have prospect licenses, exploration licenses, and exploitation licenses. And according to the website of BMP, uh, the prospect licenses are non-exclusive. They are lasting for five years, and there has been given out 21 prospect licenses up to now. On the exploration, they are exclusive for the area. They are for five years, and they can be extended for up to 16 years. There are 94 exploration licenses in Greenland now. And exploitation, they're exclusive, of course. They are for 30 years, and there are four exploitation licenses given out. So, 
Uh, this is, uh, as I have learned, uh, that these uh, minerals are both in open pit mining, as we are used in Iceland, for, just for gravel, as this picture shows, or they are a shaft, as a mine with a, with a, with a tunnel. There, are, on the east coast of Greenland, there are 11 companies with 16 exploration licenses covering nearly 9,000 square kilometers. And you can see on this map, is there a pointer here? No. Oh, on the map, if you, you can see on the map where, I, where we have marked the, 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 the white boxes, and there are uh, colored spots, there is the areas where the licenses are, are laying. On the west coast of Shore, that is the oil licenses uh, in Baffin and Disco Bay, and up there is the, on the east coast is the Kanamas area, the oil exploration area that Heida mentioned. So as you see on the east coast at least, these are our close, very close neighbor. Oil explore, exploration, on the west coast there is a EIA, in, uh, Environmental Impact Assessments, in progress. Uh, and uh, we have, not confirmation, but uh, rumors for two, two big players that they will start drilling in 2014. And the infrastructure needed, uh, how, will it, it be, how will it be carried out? Of course, on the west coast, in Greenland, there is an infrastructure in place. And I, search, I hope that the, the Greenlanders will follow the advice that we have been giving, that don't invest until you find the oil, that you, you, you make use of what you have for the initial drilling. But on the East Coast, as Heather mentioned, the situation is uh, quite different. Uh, on the East Coast, uh, there are, uh, the big players are there. The BP, Japan International Oil Company, ExxonMobil, Shell, Stato, Severon, and of course Nuna Oil in Greenland. And they had the pre-selection rights, and the pression, uh, expression of interest date was for, the, uh, yeah, they have pre-selection rights, and all of the companies this winter used the rights, and they selected the, the plots. Uh, what they call the ordinary round is that other companies can apply. The expression interest is the 15th of June this year, and delivery of application is 15th of October this year. And just how big is this? You maybe re remember that uh, uh, this winter the, the Norwegi Norwegians they made an estimate of the Drake area. 10 billion barrels, and we were very happy with it. Six million was ex ex estimated uh, Icelandic side and four billion on the Norwegian side. It is estimated there is 31 billion barrels only on the east coast in Greenland. So that's a huge, it's only an initial estimate. And the park guys, that is a a big issue, and there are a lot of skeptics about this because the package is so uh, enormous on the east coast. Uh, the package that problems have been tackled in, in Alaska and Russia with a solution like this. this uh, sorry about this, not a very good picture. But basically what this is, this is a concrete island put out if the if the oil field is not uh, that deep, that is a shallow water, you put out a concrete island and the, and the rig on top of it, and basically this is similar to what we did in, uh, about, but in much, much smaller scale. We, we, can, we can correlate to that what we did in Kolbensay at that time. But we make an island out of concrete that wears and tears maybe in 20 or 30 years, but after that we have extract oil, you can take it away. 
But this is the solutions that we will be seeing in the future on, on East Greenland. Future cooperation. Uh, it can be on processing and bulk building in Iceland. We can have a future cooperation, of course, in oil and gas, as we have been talking about. Infrastructure, power, data centers, and IT and communications. Iceland has developed for, for, some, uh, for example, for the fishing fleet, a unique system for, for surveying all the fishing fleets. Uh, everybody are now hearing because of the little fishing boats. They are turning off the systems because they don't want to be located because everybody can log into the net and see where the boats are. Uh, we are used to harsh conditions. This is taking this winter in Thestarikir. You can see on the faces of the workers how extremely cold it is. This is a drilling operation in Thestarikir. Uh, a typical mining project in Greenland uh, is something like this. There's a mine, there's a powerhouse, there's a camp, there, there's a harbor, there's a oil storage, there's a workshop, and there's a first stage processing or second stage processing, and then it is the, we have to ship it out. And in some places, the, the window for shipping out is for six weeks. So it has to be another location that's take the smaller cargoes from the specialized vessel that comes in and we build up the, the, the bulk cargo. And that can be done, for example, in Eyjafjörður. Out in Disness, uh, on the west side of the fjord, there is a, a development area made by the, by the harbor in Akureyri and others. This, this could be the, the, the location. And we can have a build-up. We can have a further processing. Or we can do what a lot of people don't think, uh, don't realize. That is, in Iceland, we have a vast experience and know-how in smelting or melting metals. We do not only have, uh, have the, the, the aluminium electrolysis smelters, we also have the, 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 the furnaces at Grundatangi. There's a vast experience and know-how running, uh, running these companies, and this is something that is worth a lot of money and the reputation we have from that. So, but how can this, this be done? Of course, I think uh, the, the same applies for Greenland as for Iceland. We are saying, why don't we, why don't we process our aluminium further? Why don't we process the fish further and the meat and the wool and whatever? Why don't we get more out of the value chain that we already have? This applies also for Greenland, I'm sure. So to do a, a project like this, we need to have a cooperation with, with Greenland. We need, for example, with oil services on the East Coast, the Icelandic government and the, and the Greenland government has to come with an agreement that there is a win-win situation that everybody get their share of the, of, the, uh, of the business that is going on with Greenland. You cannot, it never works that we have, I want it all. So I think, for example, a project like this, that we can have a first, uh, the first uh, process in Greenland, the, the granulating, for example, and then the bus building or the further processing in Iceland because we have, we have a, a, a lot of potential in this. This can be done by, by, by governmental negotiations and, and treaties. And here is it in kilometers where we are, as Heidar has gone through also. 
And but based on my conclusion is based on our good cooperation, Greenland and Iceland have a potential to work together in the future. I'm sure of it. It's not only on construction and, and so on, it is healthcare and even chess and whatever it is. Iceland has, a, has a experience in making a mega project and dealing with large global projects. We have the, the experience, and experience meaning we have made some wins and we have also made some mistakes. And I think Greenland can, can learn from that. Iceland has a limited resource in min minerals, limited, nearly none, but has a know-how, manpower, a well-established power industry. Greenland has a bundle of earth resources and an unharvested power. Greenland has limited manpower, uh, but together we can make a win-win situation out of this. If we don't have the attitude that we want it all. Uh, working, working with Iceland, the communities in Greenland will go stronger. That's my belief. Thank you. <clears throat> no, thank you, Ekur. This was uh, very interesting again. Um, we have a few minutes, actually, uh, 20 minutes of disposal uh, for questions to our speakers. Um, <clears throat> if I may take the first opportunity to, uh, to bring forward the question to, to Sven. Um, and um, so how are you dealing with this uh, enormous growth in terms of infrastructure, in terms of legislation, in terms of uh, demand, uh, people wanting to co cooperate with the Greenlanders in, in exploiting the opportunities or utilizing the opportunities ahead? How are you you're coping on that and what do you see as the main challenges in the near future? Well, the main challenge is, uh, of course, manpower when we are speaking about some of these bigger projects. And we've just uh, recently put in effect a new legislation that actually um, uh, gives permission to use other types of ag uh, agreements, uh, um, like the worker unions agreements on wages and everything that you put that into default if the project is uh, of, a, of, of a certain size uh, because we don't have the manpower to actually be in uh, to, to, to be really interested in putting in bits on the construction uh, elements of the, the these different kinds of projects but we will will take uh, many of our employees that are in the f fishing factories and uh, and uh, move them into uh, these new jobs when the projects are built mm -hmm. and ready for production. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how we're trying to cope with it because our our fishery sector is uh, is not that efficient be because you by law put on uh, a, a certain amount of the catch that they have to land on uh, onto shore to employ a lot of people. So we artificially have a lot of. Uh, um, um, employees in the fishing sector, but it doesn't uh, give sense in uh, when you're competing with uh, a lot of other countries in, in this uh, the sector. Mm -hmm. So we want to put those employees into more beneficiary uh, sectors. Uh, so uh, that, that's how we're trying to, to move around in, uh, in, in regards to, to jobs and, uh, and uh, value creation. So maybe again, if I can continue, I'd like to ask you one question, um, Heather Mar. In terms of the, the currency controls now, many things are, uh, things are happening fast in Greenland and uh, now we have currency controls which are to, to a certain extent and of course limiting our uh, opportunities to participate in the investments in Greenland. Um, do you think that that will damage uh, us in the, in the near future and, and, and uh, will we lose the train if, if we don't change these uh, policies in, in the longer time? Yes, uh, absolutely. I totally agree. I, the, the biggest uh, obstacle in Iceland towards uh, a healthy and, and sustainable future are these capital controls. We've seen, unfortunately, uh, uh, investments in Iceland collapse, collapse to a level as they were in the 1950s, when this was more an agricultural society. 
So this is practically unheard of internationally. Then we have this enviable position in the Arctic. We have these excellent neighbors, and there's very little we can do. Uh, of course, as I see it, we should also get investments into Iceland. But for a fruitful relationship between Iceland and Greenland, we have to commit capital. We cannot just go there and say, we're going to help. We want to work with you. We need to put the money where our mouth is. And we need to uh, commit capital. We have capital here. So uh, institutional investors in Iceland, I'm sure they're quite keen to participate in long-term projects. Infrastructure is such a project that uh, your payback time is 10 to 20 years. It's not like the current Icelandic stock market where it's maybe two weeks. But uh, it's more sustainable <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so I, I just hope we have the opportunity to invest something that's less casino-like and more built for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Haukur, I'd like to touch upon shipping with you. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, wind uh, opportunities for, for shipping as well. And, uh, and I believe Heidermar mentioned that we could have, uh, in, 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 in business, that we could have big shipping, what shall I, transit harbor. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Heidermar mentioned the gigantic uh, shipping uh, company to to um, uh, set up a base here. So what is your view on that, uh, having a gigantic shipping company basing here and maybe a foreign one, also in view of the uh, political situation in Iceland and sort of a, what shall I say, not necessarily the most favorable conditions for welcoming uh, outsiders? Uh, I, I totally agree with Hilder on his view on this. Uh, this can never be done without a international shipping company. Uh, what we have in Iceland is so miniature in comparison what we are talking about yeah, with the two major shipping companies here. That, uh, that is totally irrelevant to, to this uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. So in my, my mind, uh, there's nothing wrong with taking a, a big international shipping company. If they want to come and see this as a, as a preferable hub, so, so I say again, totally agree with Heather on this. So we should be cooperating. Sort of which companies, which companies might actually come in? Those are the companies which have the biggest things at stake. So uh, of course we knew that the Snow Dragon, which was on one of my pictures here, they came last year, and uh, the big Chinese oil uh, shipping company Costco uh, has expressed interest in doing something in Iceland. And on that topic uh, in itself, it's interesting because some people think, well, the Chinese are coming, they will just swallow us. And uh, I think in that regard, we have to uh, be a little bit self-assured because uh, we are a sovereign nation. And if someone comes in on our shores, he will have to uh, apply to our laws. Mm -hmm. It's also that we have all these international agreements, all these bilateral agreements. We're a part of NATO and other things. So, so our position is very strong. So I don't think we should be that much afraid. Mm -hmm. We should be open to, uh, to everyone. Mm -hmm. But as long as it is commercially sensible and as long as we hold uh, the ultimate decision power, I think it's, it's very good. And I believe that's similar with you in Greenland. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well... In regards to Greenland, uh, we are of course very aware of our our limitations, our economy, uh, our lack of ability to invest in these projects ourselves, both as, a, as our governments, or municipalities, or companies. So we are of course welcoming investors from outside, but we also put up front that we want our fair share, mm -hmm. because it's our resources, mm -hmm. and it's our country. So if if they can live with that, we welcome them. Has, has Greenland in general formulated an investment policy for well, the country as a whole? No, no, it hasn't. Well, maybe we should open up for questions out in the audience. So uh, please raise your hands and, uh, and say your name and put forward the questions if you have any, any, any questions. The sound of silence. Okay, Stefan, please. Yeah. <coughs> yes, hello. Yes, hi, my name is Stefan Sivuson. I'm uh, with VIP. 
Uh, I want to ask you, you touched upon it, but uh, I want to ask you so what's your opinion, Sven, on how to strengthen the ties between Iceland and Greenland? And uh, I also want to know, because uh, Greenland has uh, often in Iceland been associated with Denmark. You know, what's the role of Denmark in, you know, are, are the Danes uh, in some way in between Iceland or, and Greenland, or, or, or can we just strengthen the ties directly? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. It's, uh well, there, there's different notions about the relationship uh, to Denmark, and I'm I'm not uh, I'm I'm on one side, and there's also somebody on the other side. But but I think that that we are in a need, on our way to independence, to define ourselves and our own uh, our own partners to work with on these uh, issues. And of course, uh, the North Atlantic is very interesting for us, because Denmark, in this sense, is is a very small country and uh, has abilities in the whole different sector, and that's agriculture. And, uh, and, and my personal view on it is that we have to, to look at uh, Norway, Iceland and uh, Canada uh, to strengthen the ties uh, across uh, to, uh, to secure ourselves and our own future in regards to, to these uh, challenges that we, uh, we face. And uh, in regards to Denmark, I'm some are trying to, to withhold the interest uh, from the Danish side and, and mob try to mobilize their own government and uh, their own business community to put up funding for being more interested in putting in investments in Greenland to withhold the ties. But I think the train is, is leaving because the other countries, for example, China, the US, and uh, even the EU as an as a entity are, are more uh, upfront and uh, more advanced in their uh, negotiations with Greenland on this. So I think, think that Denmark is, uh, is lacking behind on this. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I certainly hope this is true and, 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 and I hope this is the development because it's more or less the only claim to fame Denmark has is Greenland. And there was a wise man that said that Denmark would only be an erotic shop in northern Germany if it wasn't for <laughs> Greenland. Yeah. So if you look at, for instance, Anders Fo Rasmussen, which is now the general secretary of NATO, <laughs> uh, uh, would he ever be the general secretary of NATO if it wasn't for Greenland? Their sort of interests are obvious. And the challenge for Icelanders in the past has been that they've most often been met by Danish people in Greenland, which are trying to keep the business to themselves. And uh, that's certainly not to the benefit of the Greenlanders. So uh, I, I think this is a very interesting meeting we have here and, and hopefully we can sort of expand on that in the future. More questions, please? Yeah, my name is Mikael Gretelsson from Iceland Air Cargo. Uh, I'm just wondering from, for Sven, from a Greenland perspective, to seek services here in Iceland, do you see big value in it and do you see that you will be seeking the service from here, especially for the East Coast and logistics especially? It's, it looks natural for us to do it because uh, there's already a build-up of, of infra infrastructure when you take uh, the airline connections. And, uh, but, but, but I think it has, uh, the frequencies has to, uh, on, on the number of flights and uh, the seasons of uh, high, high peak season in, in regards to, 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 uh, to flights, uh, there has to be a, a build up on that also. Uh, for example, when I've, I've, uh, I wanted to go here directly from Iluliset where I live now, it, 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 would be a, it was a problem. I had to go through Nuuk. Uh, so, so that it gives limitations already in regards to the actual need. And, and we have to be aware of it because the development comes when you put out the, um, uh, the infrastructure for the use. For example, internet, when you take the sea cable. I, I, before I, I went into uh, the board of, uh, of the National Telecommunications Company, we had an argument, uh, official argument with, with the director of, uh, of the technical department where we, we said to him, we, we need more capacity. That was before the sea cable. 
I said, what do you want to use it for? So you don't have to interest uh, you on what we're going to use it for. You just have to provide it and we will fill out the capacity. That's also with uh, the airways uh, and the, the shipping and because it has limitations. And uh, you look at it in Greenland on the shipping side, we have the national uh, shipping company, uh, Royal Arctic Line, and it gives limitations on, on the shipping on itself because it, of course it wants to protect their own business and it wants to direct uh, the way that we use the shipping company. But they define it themselves. It's not the customers that, that uh, are in a position to define it out of their own need. So, so we have to rethink it. I think uh, we'll, you'll see a process in Greenland for the next couple of years where they will actually put a lot of questions to, to their own companies on, on these issues because it's, it gives limitations on our own development. We cannot have it again that, uh, for example, when Cairn was drilling, that, uh, that the service station was Aberdeen. Not Iceland, but not Nook. <laughs> it was Aberdeen with nine vessels. Yeah. That's correct. Any more questions? Click. Then I'd like to propose uh, or, or put one, uh, one question forward. Um, are you experienced the uh, interest to invest from any particular area in the world, any particular countries? Is it mainly coming from, from Asia, from Europe, or all over the place? Or are there any countries which are specifically interested in cooperating with Greenland, of course, in addition to Iceland? <laughs> the question for me? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. Uh, of course, China and South Korea are, are very uh, keen on making strong ties to Greenland. Mm -hmm. uh, our challenge is that uh, Denmark is, is, is uh, they are in, uh, in a mental state where they still think that they, uh, they are in a position to define our development and also the EU. And, uh, and because of their views on uh, how to uh, perceive in, in, and how to step forward in regards to us, I think they give themselves limitations on their future role in Greenland because we're not satisfied with it. We are our own country, we are our own, country our own entity with our own identity, and we're very strong on it. When you look at, uh, at the vote in 2009 where um, the, the Greenlandic people uh, voted for if, if they wanted more independence or not. 76% of the population voted yes. And that's when you also take into account the 10,000 foreigners live in Greenland mm -hmm. and most of them didn't vote. So you could, uh, you could even take the number further up and say, well, if the Greenlanders wanted yes, of course, almost everybody wants it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but, but people don't really, well, uh, the, the Danes and, and the EU doesn't have that, uh, that notion on, on, on how we think and uh, how we perceive ourselves and what our will are. Mm -hmm. But we want this. So, uh, and of course I think that, that Iceland is, uh, and Icelanders are, are more aware of this because you have been through the same process, yes. even with the same colonizer. <coughs> so, so, uh, it's, it's so it's like interesting <laughs> for us. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, there were some many things which are sort of a similar, which we can see dating back in our history. Yeah. Following up on that question, then I'd like to ask you, uh, Hauke, you mentioned the, the exploitation licenses uh, that they were for 30 years. That is also something which we did in our times that we have done, um, sort of a made long-term contracts uh, on the energy side, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and it's now my question. Um, do you see that, that Greenland should go into these long-term contracts? Yes, of course. Uh, who will spend the money if they don't see the investment go ba come back to them? You have to get, uh, get, get, get it. It must be worthwhile. And so you think th 30 years is something that, that uh, they should be committing to? Yeah, that is, uh, that is sort of the, the minor mining industry standards. And, okay, I'm and, sorry. and <coughs> what I have been seeing... Uh, both in the Greenland session in Tor Toronto and what I've been uh, that on, the, on the mining conference that is there every year, is uh, that uh, the Greenland authorities, they are handling it wa rather well. Mm -hmm. it, they, are, they are doing their job, they are doing their basic service very well. 
uh, mapping and everything. So, so it's, uh, it's very professional mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Please, it's the microphone. Thank you. My name is Kjartan Gunnarsson. I just wanted to ask Mr. Sven, and well, first I would like to thank you for your very balanced and interesting lecture. But uh, now we have just recently seen the Arctic uh, Council in conference in uh, Kiruna, was it? Mm -hmm. And there was the Greenland government excluded by our very good friend, Mr. Carl Bildt, the arrogant minister of foreign affairs for Sweden. How is uh, the Greenland government, do you think, going to react to that very unfriendly decision? Well, uh, we took a very simple stance on that, uh, and that we boycotted uh, uh, the conference, and we put it up openly, that we needed a place at the, at the table and not at, at the side. And, uh, and now they are they're struggling in, uh, in Arctic Council with this. But we are very firm on it because we, we, uh, we really need the, the recognition. So it's a, it's a process now, but we put it out there and now they are, they are struggling it with, with themselves. Yeah. I, I, I actually have to admit I grew up in Sweden. And I should be friends with Sweden, but I'm certainly not friends with Karl Bildt. He, <laughs> he has uh, given Iceland a terrible time, just so I share our experience. Yeah. And he even tried to block the IMF sort of assistance to Iceland after the collapse. And he's an awful guy. So <laughs> we know that. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Please. Yes, uh, thank you for your, for your presentation. My name is Ingolver and I'm a consultant here in Iceland. Uh, concerning uh, the key ingredients for construction in the North Arctic was mentioned as global warming. And, and I think Heida Maur mentioned that a couple of times. Also, he mentioned about the next, I think, is the most key ingredients. That's the power. Nothing is going to happen without uh, the right power, even construction, oil, or, or mining. What you didn't mention, any of you, in your presentation was the possibility of exporting power from Greenland to, to key countries. I know Heda mentioned the cable, but there was nothing mentioned in or from the Greenland or Danish government's part. Are they willing to do so? And is the legislation in place? And do you see... Uh, the possibility of trans-Arctic or trans-Atlantic cable using Iceland as a, as a hub for servicing Europe with uh, green power, so to speak? Well, um, I've done a project on preliminary basis with a, a colleague of mine on, uh, on trying to, to see if we could uh, pile up uh, several hydropower stations um, to have the capacity to export energy to to Canada, because there's a there's an interesting energy energy grid that you can tap into if you uh, if you utilize more uh, or civil uh, hydropower uh, sites, and it, it's feasible, it is, but it's expensive. Um, but you if you see it as 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 the world market. And, uh, and see who the players are. The, the Norwegians are, are very dominant in regards to the Nordic countries when they, they put in uh, submersible cables uh, to several uh, destinations in Europe and exporting and importing uh, uh, power. Um, and and, and it's, it's of course possible also uh, on the east coast of Greenland uh, through Iceland and, and, and further on. Um, but it's that not many uh, that I know of that have done the preliminary uh, uh, um, 
surveys to see if if uh, if it's possible or feasible and so on. But we have done it on the west coast. Uh, the legislation are into place also in regards to um, uh, if you build a power uh, station, hydropower station. Uh, the legislation states that after 40 or maybe 60 years, depending on the, the actual uh, commitments uh, in the agreements, you have to to deliver that uh, entity back to the government. So it's possible for you to do it on uh, commercial uh, terms, but there's a uh, delivery back period after uh, 40 or 60 years. So that's also into place. And that uh, that project that drove that type of legislation was, of course, the Alcoa project, aluminium project, where there was a lot of questions in regards to uh, lack of legislation. So you see many of these mega projects, they actually, uh, when they are being developed, they also produce a lot of legislation work because it has to be into place before you actually can put those projects into production. So we don't put in something into production if, it, if the legislation isn't there. <coughs> so it drives the legislation process also. And if we, if we put it into uh, an Icelandic perspective, <coughs> uh, we're talking about building an interconnector, a cable from Iceland yeah. to Scotland. It's around 1,000 uh, megawatts, one gigawatt. And it would be like 1,000 kilometers or 1,100. But on from the east coast of Greenland, if we yeah. go off from Nuuk or north of Nuuk over to Canada, would probably be like 14, 1500 kilometers. But the power on that side, you could easily create a cable that's three gigawatts, 3000 megawatts, 4000, something like that. But the challenge is that you have many different hydropower potential, but you don't have a national grid to connect them all together and then take the power out. And the challenge in Greenland is that this is a cluster of islands. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the cable would be uh, sort of on the surface and very often it would be subsea. So it's, 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 it's less easy than here, than it, where it's just one island. So that's the sort of engineering challenge. Mm -hmm. um, then I think just finally I have one question and it's a question for the audience. How many of you have been to Greenland? Please raise your hands. Oh, oh, that's good. That's good. Okay, uh, <coughs> uh, it's uh, over time now, and um, I'd like to thank the speakers, Sven, uh, Höykur, and uh, Heather, uh, for your interesting uh, contribution and spe speeches, and valuable input, and the organizers, Vafepie, uh, RSE, uh, I think for the initiative of organizing this meeting, and I thank you all for coming and wish you a nice day. Thank <clears throat> you.